All right, we're here with Chris Moore over at IX Systems. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, so you have uh, you started forever ago in this BSD thing. Uh, yeah, I guess if I mean technically, if you want to go way way back, I started when I was still a teenager in high school. Um, yeah, and actually, it's funny I tell this story because I've heard the same story from so many other people about my age. But it was at a dial-up ISP in the '90s. So mid nineties, you know, I walk in, I'm green. I had never heard of FreeBSD or Unix for that matter. I'd you know, grown up kind of on DOS and Windows. Walk in and sure enough, the dial up ISP is running FreeBSD 2 or something. It was early, early days. I was just barely aware of it at the time. But as part of that, I got a Telnet account into one of the systems so that we could reset stuck dial up modems. And over time, you know, that kind of introduced me to this whole command line concept, which I had come out of the DOS era a little bit, so it wasn't yeah. too foreign. It was just learning to type LS instead of DIR. That was probably the intersection <laughs> I was. Um, but no, it was, it was really cool. And then they, you know, the internet was just starting to be a thing in our area. And so they gave me an account where I could put up an HTML page and, you know, hey, mom, look, I have a web page, you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff, right? I think I was like... 15, 16 at the time. So that would have been mid nineties. But uh, that was the first time I really, you know, became aware of other things out there besides, uh, you know, Windows and Mac world. And then uh, sometime during college, I worked at the IT, uh, IT department for a summer and they were just getting rid of hardware. So I had all these old systems and I couldn't afford Windows licenses. I had no money. So yeah, I ended up loading uh, Linux and BSD on them and kind of playing around rediscovering it in probably the late nineties, early two thousands. And then um, worked for one place, set up a Linux server, had some problems. And I, I remember thinking, you know, the ISP, I remember Sean, our administrator there, swore by it, said how great FreeBSD was. So I hadn't played with it in a few years at that point, grabbed it, threw it on the system and never looked back. So this would have been like 2001, maybe. So it's yeah. been a while now. And then that curved all the way into you uh, being the head guy for uh, PCBSD, right? So that's kind of, yeah, that's, that's what started this quest. Um, <laughs> I just got tired of dealing with Windows viruses, problems, breakage, and I really wanted an open source desktop. I was really big into the open source concept, still am to this day. And uh, you know, I experimented with some different things. And what really irked me was FreeBSD. I went to Best, you know, like most people did in the day, I went to Best Buy or CompUSA. And you see all these nice box sets of SUS Linux. Yeah, or, Mand or Mandrake, if you remember Mandrake. I did. I, my first software firewall was actually a Mandrake one. <laughs> See, and actually one of the ones I had bought was a Lindos, if you remember Lindos yes. before yep. they became Linspire and that whole thing. And I remember thinking, well, why doesn't BSD have, you know, their equivalent, the nice box where it shows a graphical installer on the back because everything was text-based, right? Yeah. Server. And so that's what just inspired me to say, you know what, I'm going to see if I can write a graphical desk or a graphical I guess a desktop, if you will, but enough of the tools to make it feasible to run FreeBSD on the desktop. So that turned into writing a graphical installer. And then over time, you know, packaging KDE3, I think is what it was <laughs> back when we started. Packaging <laughs> KDE3 and figuring out all the nightmare of cups and printers and sound wow. and, and then starting to write little tools because there was no tool to set up Wi-Fi. And most of the tools coming from the Linux community didn't work on BSD. There was very different uh, subsystems underneath on how they... Uh, the, how they talk to the, the nuances system. of that are not simple. <laughs> no, they're not. So a lot of times I either worked on porting things or just eventually broke down and said, you know, what, I'm just going to write one from scratch because the problem is you'd port it once. And then when there's an update three weeks later, everything's broken again. Right. You know, the Linux community is moving pretty quick in those days and they still do. And that's good. We all are. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. It's, it's come a long way because BSD was never, uh, well, just in general, you spent forever trying to get the mouse to work with the X config file and things like oh. that. So was <laughs> I've seen one too many xorg.confs in my day or uh, it just, yeah, that was, uh, that was actually the trickiest part of doing a desktop on BSD was just always getting X to work and drivers and compatibility and yeah. figure out screen resolutions. I mean, it's gotten better in recent years, of course, but uh, yeah, kids these days nice. don't know how lucky they have it. I mean, you, you load a <sighs> month of modern distributions. It just works, finds all the hardware and just yep. magic. <laughs> well, my kids, they all have true OS on their desktops at home. Oh. And right, they, you know, from their perspective, it's just, it's a neat desktop where they can play Minecraft and have mm -hmm. a command prompt and do some stuff, but they don't know the pain and suffering that went into bringing them that level of a product, right? Where you could actually put it on there and just worry about Minecraft and running Firefox and email and stuff. So 
it was uh, definitely an adventure <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So that brings you all the way to uh, FreeNAS and IX Systems. So you got that sure. strong BSD background. And then, mm -hmm. see, I didn't, I knew of IX Systems, but not much about them. But I've been a longtime user of the FreeNAS product. You know, I yep. used it when, you, it's, I think everyone at home, I got a bunch of movies, Plex server runs on it. That's like a common one. Then just a place to store all your files. Sure. And uh, so when I started my business a number of years ago, it became, uh, one of the easy ways for us to store all the data for our customers. We're like, hey, this is just easy. Because managing it in Linux was just never as easy as I thought it should be. FreeNAS just kind of sure. simplified all the time. I remember what the first version I loaded, but man, it was when it was, it was a lot more work to set up than it is today. <laughs> Might have been like an 8.0 or a 7 or maybe 9. Just depends on how far back it was. Yeah, probably around 7. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to remember when we put that server in. It seems like... Oh gosh, were you on UFS before it went to ZFS? Oh yeah, when that? you could okay. choose, Yeah, it was you as UFS. That's what I'm trying to remember. Okay. Yeah, it was probably 7 then. <laughs> you go way back. Yeah, we suffered through all the pain of uh, doing it UFS. And uh, once everything went to ZFS, uh, wow. And yeah. I'm, uh, we actually just interviewed him last week is Michael Lucas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, he's fun. He's a local guy here. So I've been to several of his talks on ZFS and he runs the local BSD users group, which I go to and uh, which are all, it's funny, half the people there all work for an ISP. That's like the right. thing is <laughs> you, if you work at ISP, you run BSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's still going strong. You'd be shocked <laughs> how many of them still run that. Yeah, but uh, it, IX Systems, uh, when I went through some of the channel partner training, uh, wow, you guys have a long history as a company of contributing back to the open source community. So it's not like IX Systems came after FreeNAS. It helped foster oh. development of FreeNAS. It's kind of backwards from when I originally had I mean, thought about it. You could say at IX Systems, open source is in our blood. I mean, if you go back early enough to the founding days when uh, Matt Olander, Mike Loth, when they first formed uh, IX Systems, it was out of the ashes of BSDI, which was in the 90s, of course, yeah. supporting BSD. And so, I mean, that was just kind of in the water here from day one, right? You know, uh, we this isn't new to us. We aren't late converts to the whole open source movement or BSD in general, you know, again, it's Literally, there are people here going all the way back to the very first free, you know, free BSD 1.0, 2.0 days, and who still work on it. And and you guys are still, you know, been developing the hardware for that long. So, you, yep. and someone pointed out something. Uh, I, you know, there's always you the, the evil that is YouTube comments. There's always a snarky person, and we did a review of it. And someone says, "Hey, that looks just like this box." Blah blah blah. IX System doesn't build stuff. They actually just. Uh, did, uh, you know, they were trying to imply it was someone else's box, but after I went through the channel partner training, I'm like, no, you guys actually sell white labeled other companies. You're the source of we a do. lot of this hardware. We, for a lot of stuff we are, for sure. We've been an integrator for a long time, more than just a, a server vendor. So um, yeah, you'll see our stuff in all kinds of places you might not have expected it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is one of those things you look at it, you're like, that looks suspiciously like a true NAS box, but uh, which also gives you guys a lot of insight into uh, the design because you're you're designing at the cutting edge. You're the designer, not just grabbing something generic off the shelf. Um, I found it very interesting in the Junas boxes, the way the backplane with the dual motherboards come uh, talk to each other for the motherboard failover redundancy. That's that's unique to you guys, isn't it? I mean, that's that's pretty unique. And if you've looked at like the M series, the new stuff you see, we're we're pretty cutting edge too. Like we're doing NTB. So non-transparent bridge between the two, uh, two uh, I know we're not supposed to say nodes anymore. Is it controllers? So controllers one and two, nodes. you can't even say A and B, right? I got to yeah. get the terminology, right? It's so a controller <laughs> one and two inside the chassis. But uh, no, and then NTB bridge over PCI Express, and then we're using that to do some neat things with like NVDIM for caching technology. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. We're definitely... Yeah, I wouldn't say on the bleeding, bleeding edge because we're, you should see what it goes through here on the QA department <laughs> to bring it out to you, the consumer. Yes. But uh, definitely on the cutting edge as far as what, what we can do with the latest technology and then, of course, have it powered by FreeNAS and, of course, it's big brother TrueNAS. Yeah, and I think that's a really cool concept because um, there's like a delay from the, because we have a handful of uh, clients now that have the TrueNAS installed mm -hmm. and uh, they've noticed that delay like, hey, there's, a, there's U5 now out of FreeNAS, but there's a testing delay before TrueNAS gets, yeah. which is, you guys have this in a, well, as you claim, the largest test base of users in the world because so many people are running FreeNAS. And that's, uh, that that's really, that once again, gives you that edge. And I think that's a very yeah. interesting concept. 
Well, that's very deliberate. I mean, yeah, we have a great QA department here, but you know, but the same token, we can't possibly QA every scenario, every application out there, every right. possible use case. We're still discovering here, here, what are we are eight years into this with FreeNAS? We're still discovering use cases that we had. Oh, I hadn't considered using FreeNAS that way. Oh, you do that? Oh, weird, but cool. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. And, and, and the forums have been great for that. I've learned a lot about it. And, you know, just using the forums, I, uh, our, our stack in here is a Zen server, iSCSI, 10 gigabit links to FreeNAS. And it's just amazing how well it works. Um, yeah, that's awesome. We have some uh, issues that we created uh, mm -hmm. by seeing, like you said, weird configurations that would probably have you guys scratching your head, but that's part right. of the fun of it. <laughs> that is part of the challenge. And that's what's so cool about the open source movement and, and just us being open source. We encourage that kind of thing. We, we look forward to it and we ask people contribute back your ideas, your patches, you know, let's make this a better product just for everybody across the board. And, and you know, back to your point about the QA, you know, that's very deliberate. We try and always have a two to four week window between a free NAS release before, you know, the same code ends up on a true NAS, just to double check our work, if anything, to make sure once it gets out to the community, we don't see a forum post a week later saying, oh, you forgot something for Samba, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and maybe that might have happened around U3 or might have been one pointer. It's happened in the past enough to tell <laughs> us that this is a good model to stay on, right? <laughs> yeah. You're proving why it's a good model. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, knock on wood, we try and have less instances like that going forward. But no, it's been fantastic. And then people test at scales that we can't necessarily try in our lab too so it's good for performance testing also oh yeah it, especially um i actually just consulted with someone the other day that's running a similar setup there they want to move uh from uh vmware over to uh the zen server well, the new i don't know if you're familiar with the new xcpng it's a fully open source zen stack no i haven't seen that one okay. um yeah, Citrix wasn't behaving. Is okay. best. They, they changed all the rules and broke a lot of features. With They they snuck in an update. And everyone just says yes, and I agree. It changed all the rules that you don't get all the features unless you buy extra licenses. Oh. Yeah, so when you go from oh. 7.2 to 7.3, very little function very little function change other than license changes. So Yeah, that's yeah, a shame. So they that's, said, that's when good open source goes bad. <laughs> that's kind of what it is. Uh, Citrix was contributing back to the upstream, um, but they were disabling features and adding a license key to everything yeah. you want or not. So uh, the new spin from these other guys, and of course the, the more popular uh, software to use is FreeNAS on the back end or even TrueNAS in this other client. Mm -hmm. um, because iSCSI just works really, really well for this. Yeah. Now, I've been a proponent of that here at IX2 saying, we don't take features away, you add features. <laughs> you don't. Oh, yeah. You know, that's just a horrible model. You end up pissing off your community, and then here comes the fork. <laughs> you know, yep, here bad. comes the fork because you decided, and that's kind of what they did. They, uh, yeah, we've been in doubt, fork it. That's, that was a nice thing when we started working and doing our own testing with the TrueNAS uh, for our videos, that there was no all the buttons are in the same place. There's a couple extra cause there's a support button. Like mm -hmm. there's, but the familiarity of the OS is really transparent. So if you're um, a company running free NAS and you go, I think I'm ready. I want that enterprise level uh, speed support, everything. When you move mm -hmm. over to it, I, I don't know if the config files will copy over, but I will tell you the interface is the same. Actually the database is mostly similar. You'd probably be surprised how much would copy over, but the interface is mostly the same. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the new UI, which is getting ready to launch here, uh, beta one of 11.1 or 11.2, excuse me. It's supposed to be launching here in the next week or so. Um, but yeah, eventually you'll have the TrueNAS version of that and it'll add HA functionality. So you'll have HA alarms and alerts. And then of course your support tab and just some of the other features that go into TrueNAS. Um, there's some other things like fiber channel that don't necessarily make an appearance in FreeNAS. As well. Yeah, Fiber Channel. I am. There's a lot of hate in on Fiber Channel, though. I right. noticed that it's. It right. seems to be really finicky technology. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. But you know, there's we still have people who want it and deploy it. So, <laughs> gotta support yeah. them. Yeah. Well, you know, in in iSCSI works really well. Now, yeah. uh, a little bit of in, in. I don't know where where we uh, run out of some of your knowledge here. Okay. Uh, capacity planning now. You guys are all in on ZFS, which is awesome. But the thing I've reminded people when they start talking about this and, you know, your sales guys uh, reiterate this to clients, uh, I'm sure all the time, is you can't just say, well, I can fill it up to 99%, right? No, 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 no. We even have some quotas on the TrueNAS side we set long before that to avoid you from hitting that point, right? 
you know, ZFS tends to get really cranky when you start getting above, you know, 90, 95%. You want to try and keep it under that. So you have usable room for, for the end users who don't understand why it's a copy on write file system. So when you right. go to do a write, if there's no contiguous blocks free, you know, large enough to store that new block that's coming in, well, you're going to spend a lot of times, you know, spinning around looking for those places to put those blocks. And you know, when you get that full, it gets more difficult. And I believe in, you guys have some write-up on this, but I'm hoping this uh, documentation gets expanded because I've uh, spoke before um, with some of the engineers on it. And it sounds like the, the limitations, it's kind of a fuzzy number. And I think like I said, it comes down to testing. When we use iSCSI on a ZFS VAL, how much free space should there be? Right now, I think your documentation says half the drive should always be free. I don't know. I don't know why they arrived at that number, to be honest. I wasn't part of that testing. So yeah. that is kind of where my knowledge runs out on why that was the best practice or use case. It, um, is, it is a debate that it looks like a, yeah. a religious debate in the forums of people on one side or the other. And we don't know yeah. who's right. <laughs> it's kind of like the whole ECC versus non-ECC if you want to get into a religious debate. Oh, man, that one. I'm um, kind of on the non-ECC. I think the copy and write's resilient enough. I don't know. Where do you stand on this? Well, so for our enterprise product, everything's ECC. Free NAS Mini, yes. ECC. I get it. I mean, ECC makes sense for beyond the storage, just for the, the actual appliance mm -hmm. itself, right? Yeah. But honestly, my desktops, my home systems, all non-ECC. You know, I, it's the same risk I would take running anything else non-ECC. There's nothing inherently special about ZFS that makes it more susceptible to running on that, ECC versus non. So if anything, like, I feel better running it on non ECC you know, because when my, my system panics or whatever, I'm not having to start up and do an F sick and all that. Well, it's funny. So um, kind of what led us, I don't know if you had ever seen a video we did on the resilience of ZFS where we kept popping memory out of a, I did. Yeah. I did. So, Gosh, that was a while ago, right? It was a while ago. Was last, I think it was last year he did that. Yeah. And we actually have a, we have a series of tests we are, are going to be doing um, directly related to that about, we're going to get some motherboards wet. <laughs> Okay. Because we think it may be fun. And we want to inv involve firecrackers if we have time tomorrow because it's 4th of July and we want to go wreck some stuff. <laughs> but Man, you sound like you want to work at Underwriter Laboratories, you know, where the guys, they sit here and try and get things to catch on fire and, you know. All yeah, <laughs> just I want to see how far we can push it. <laughs> but it was kind of my point uh, with A6, copy and write, the way ZFS essentially, and Michael Lucas, did a, he's much more articulate than me, he wrote those books on ZFS. Mm -hmm. um, but the way the copy and write file system, so to speak, has you know, the layers of it, that makes it very resilient to, hey, you may lose at, because if you're writing at the moment, you may lose some of that write because, well, the memory died, but the yeah. overall integrity is, is, yeah. in sa is saved. And that's what's the most important. Because you're always, at any given time, data in flight, data on its way through the uh, buffers, the processor, the memory, you could lose something because the power occurred, you know, sure. during that. Uh, but we actually, and we had an incident, one of those, you probably wouldn't have tested this, but uh, we had a processor that went bad in our uh, machine, which was weird. Um, okay. yeah. It was on our Zen server. And so we got another processor, Dell overnighted. That's all fun. But when my, they plugged it in, they didn't click it all the way for the iSCSI connectors. So it was oh. dropping in and out repetitively. And uh, it turns out it doesn't corrupt the uh, Z vowels at all. Uh, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> it that's... just causes all kinds of mystery <laughs> problems for a little while, but uh, that you are beating your head against the wall, then all of a sudden you touch it and you click it and you're like, oh, look, all the problems went away. Well, I mean, we've seen things like, you know, we're testing SAS expanders and all, oh, you know, the cables broke or loose or whatever, but you know, it never really gets to the level of we've lost data or we've corrupted anything. It's more just, oh, that's annoying. We need to fix that component, right? We're never, even internally, that's not a thing where we're in the back of our mind thinking about corruption, right? That yeah. just gives you an idea of how infrequent we even would run into something like that. I, I think that's one of those things I, I, uh, I fully trust ZFS. Um, so I keep it and I also clone it to another ZFS. So I think that's what we're having to move to for data because we don't know where it's going in the future. So um, I, kinda, I was laughing about this. You know, I was just kind of thinking of some stuff. Like I used to have one of those Sony cameras in the 90s that had the floppy disk. Oh, yeah. oh, floppy disk in this building, I don't think. Maybe somewhere in a box, but I think we probably sure. threw it away. But you kind of like have to keep moving to the new media. And at one time I used the zip disk. We remember those and things like that. But because I've always, uh, one of the things Z, the free NAS has always done for me, both my personal and my business data is keeping it kind of in motion all the time. So it's mm -hmm. always alive there. That way I never have to worry about it. Cause I, 
found old hard drives that I know had something on them. They don't spin anymore. I don't know why. They spun. Yeah. I set them aside in like old data if I ever need it, and I plugged them in and they don't turn on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so I think more people are going to keep it live. So I think we're going to see a lot more growth in uh, ZFS, especially if you spend any time in the Reddit home lab. Those people are the data hoarders in the home lab. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as people, you know, with the push to digital media, 4K, you know, people doing home, I mean, pictures, heck, my wife's photo you know, catalog isn't getting any smaller. Nope. So, and of now course, if I we ever lose it, I'm uh, dead. 97,000 some odd photos last time I checked my personal. Yeah. It, yep. It's accumulation of years. It's not last year. That's forever. And then my phone, I don't know. I don't yeah. put all of them on the ZFS because I, I take too many with my phone. Yep. <laughs> like unlimited well, film. And you wait as VR picks up the, you know, the size of those data files. And it's just, it's not going to end, right? And no. So FreeNAS is, and ZFS, you know, underneath, they're just going to have to keep evolving to adapt to be able to, you know, service the just growing needs of data. You know, you're, I can't even imagine what it's going to be in 20 years. No, uh, I... I know this was a proposal. This comes up a lot. Uh, and because of the ZFS structure, you can't just expand it. Like, you know, I like some of the other companies, they magically, you just drop drives in and it just ex magically expands the storage. And uh, yeah. ZFS doesn't do it quite in the same way. But I, isn't there a proposal to change that or so, am I mistaken? Um, Matt Aarons, one of the founders of ZFS, is doing a project co-sponsored by IX and the FreeBSD Foundation for RAID Z expansion. Maybe that's what you yeah. read about or heard about yep. that you're referring to here. So the idea is there, if you're in a RAID Z group, you go ahead and throw another disk in. And at that point, it can actually reflow some of the data okay. on your disk at that point so you can magically grow. Right. But, you know, ZFS, you could always add more, you know, more VDEVs and yes. expand that way as well. So it's not a complete non-starter. You have other ways to, to grow yeah. your as needed. Yeah. So that's it's an important distinction. I know how to do it that way, but it's always, I, I wish it was an easier way to explain it to people who yeah. first start out with FreeNAS because they go, I can't just put on a drive in it just adds it to the pool, right? No. <laughs> a couple caveats there, a little yeah. asterisks, right? A little asterisks, yeah. kind yeah. of. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> No, so that's an exciting project. We're happy to be able to help sponsor that work, and we know folks have asked for it, and we're looking forward to seeing that uh, come into the tree. I think that was slated to be done in a year, so that would put it out at price start of 2019. I think there's that whole thing. And it's like, you know, it's like we said in the beginning about IA system. This is you guys are your lifeblood is working back and forth directly with open source developers, and uh, I, it makes me happy because I, I love seeing companies that don't just. To, you know, build a business model going, hey, we can support this product. That's a business model. You guys are like, hey, let's help uh, develop these other projects and yep. things like that. So you're, you know, direct community give back, which is pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. And, I'll, you know, just to tease the FreeNAS community who watches this too, I'll give you guys a little tidbit. So keep your eye out for 11.3. We've been working really hard on trying to bring over native crypto. Ooh. ZFS. So that was some of the work that came out of uh, ZFS on Linux. But uh, that's going to allow proper encryption to be done at the data set level. So you can ah. have data set keys. And then my personal favorite is that you can now replicate keeping your data encrypted. You don't have to have the key on the remote side. So if, you have, if you're replicating to something in the cloud, maybe you don't trust the cloud provider. Well, just don't put your keys on there, but you can still store your data in an encrypted form. You, you just killed one of my videos. Like I was, gonna, oh, I was working... <laughs> It knows a, so, you know, I, I'm uh, a lot of people, you know, in the Linux community being really privacy centric. That's one of the things I said. Well, I said, you can use the cloud sync, but of course, it's going to sync it unencrypted. So you want to encrypt it and then save it over on this side of the drive. You guys like yeah. solving these problems. Yeah, no, we're thinking ahead. These are the problems we want to solve for ourselves, too. Well, I'm not going to waste my time in that video. <laughs> well, speaking of cloud sync, though, we did add the encryption feature for 11.2. So you will be able to turn on encryption for that and it'll encrypt it on the client side before it sends. Okay, so. good. That's going to be good as well. But, you know, there's something more comforting about having a block level uh, replication yes. where you get everything, right? Cloud Sync is basically still converting it to S3. And then you know, some stuff fits in that model, some stuff doesn't. Yeah. So, no, I, I like where you're going with this. This is, so you guys are really future thinking here. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be. Uh, we all dream too, you know, a lot. The cool thing about IX, one of the things I just love working here is it's just a bunch of geeks. We're all a bunch of nerds. We, we go home and do this stuff for fun. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like, oh, darn, I'm done working. OK, now I can go home and now fool, fool around with that patch I wanted to play with. <laughs> right. It, exactly. You know so what? That, that's, that's the culture. Um, here. 
I learned early on, and I, I've been an open source advocate uh, for a long time, and I learned early on I'm, n I'm not a great coder. <laughs> so I decided my contribution back is making tutorials, creating documentation. That's my contribution back to open source, doing interviews with open source people. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, to be honest, I don't even get to code very much anymore with what I do, but I still enjoy, you know, I, I help roll TurtleS, which is our now our server-based FreeBSD distribution. So, you know, it, we, we help out where we can. Yeah, yeah, as you have the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it is it's a it's a passion. Um, it's so I we had a weird opportunity with so I belong. Uh, we also do a podcast called the Sunday Morning Links Review. Me and a few other friends, mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of a weird coincidence. Microsoft picked up on us. They wanted us to do the interviews when they had all their Linux and Azure stuff. Oh. So. Okay. We were skeptics, but we're like, we're a Linux podcast, but if you're buying a ticket, we'll come out and interview your people. And they actually gave sure. us like Jeffrey Snover, who is a, a really interesting guy to interview, you know, founder cool. of a lot of things over there, um, over at Microsoft. But uh, it's such a different culture versus, you know, I'm a regular at any Linux fest within uh, 200 miles of here. I've been to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. Such a different, I love the open vibe you have there. Microsoft, I told them they have a long way to go to their conferences, like to, to make it. I, I, I invited a couple of those people. They said they're going to start attending some of the um, Linux. You got to give, you gotta give Microsoft different. a little credit. At least they're trying now. At least you're trying now. The Microsoft to 10 years ago, maybe not so much, but at least they're, they're putting an effort in. And yeah, yeah, they have a long way to go. We'll see what the next 10 years holds. That's how I feel. Like the, the open source vibe you get is way way more passionate people, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, sharing. Um, Microsoft, I always, you get that weird vision. They're just here to monetize it in some way. I'm like, <laughs> right. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> yeah. But I won't talk on it too much, but okay. you know, they're, sure. they're at least, they're at least uh, something we have to address in the market, which, That's right. which is fine because uh, one thing I get to admit, you guys did a great job and I believe it's because you hired some more people specifically to work on this project. Mm -hmm. uh, Active Directory used to be a difficult challenge with FreeNAS. I got to admit, it's actually become like a few clicks. It's uh, the, it's gotten better. Oh yes, like way yeah. better. And uh, I was I remember when I first set one up. Well, we recently did one, and I was like, wow, that just because it was all the latest version with the FreeNAS. I'm like that was just sure. like <laughs> smooth, way less painful. And and to be honest, the guys who you know the team that's kind of behind that isn't really satisfied with that even I think they still would like to simplify it even further and make it easier if you're a true NAS customer we have things on our agenda like simplifying HA setup you know we want to make that just brain dead simple just a couple clicks through a wizard it sets up your pool HA setup ask some network config and done right so yeah, yeah we want to get to that point too so that's really cool and that's like I said, that's another, uh, you, you guys are just really hitting all the right keys. Because people always says, well, why do you use FreeNAS? Why don't you try this or try that? I'm like, it ain't broke. Like it does everything it wants <laughs> and then more. Actually, I'm not even, you know, as much as I have turned on there, there's always a couple more things we could turn on. And, um, you know, and because we, you know, help people uh, deploy, like I said, I'm part of the channel partner program now is selling your hardware. So mm -hmm. it's, I really great. believe in the product. So <laughs> That's great. Well, I'll put the call out again. We're getting ready to issue this new beta release here uh, for 11.2 in the next few weeks. This is going to be the first one that has the new Angular UI. So that ah. UI we've had since... 8, 9, 10, you know, et cetera, is finally going away. We're bringing Angular in. You know, we've done a ton of QA. As a matter of fact, QA is roped in just about people from every other department to help beat this up internally. But now that we're putting it out to the community, you know, feedback, comments, especially bug reports would be fantastic. I'll and be on it. <laughs> keep in mind, it's going to be evolving too. What we've done right now is mostly a straight port of the old UI to the new framework. But, you know, going forward, we have plans to go back and kind of rototill those sections, Active Directory being a great example. By mentioning that, like at some point, we want to take a release, sit down and go, you know what, if we wanted to redo AD and make it just brain dead simple, how would we do that? Let's, let's come up with a new design. You know, I, I really love your choice of uh, the integration of the net data project mm -hmm. in there. That's just, I use that um, already on a lot of servers. Just a great visualization to kind of see where sure. your servers are doing. And I'm like, I was excited when I seen that it dropped right into FreeNAS. I'm like, oh, this is, this is nice. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, that's one of the beautiful things about an open source project like this. Sure, we can bring things in as plugins and stuff, but eventually it's like, we should just have that in the base, you know, appliance itself. So MinIO S3 was a good example. That's MinIO under the hood. And then bringing net data in is like, wow, this is a fantastic little project. We should have this on FreeNAS and not force people to go try and you know do a side load. Yeah, and I, I did a whole tutorial just on net data. I mean, it's so easy, especially uh, because of the way the 
underlying config file works, you can just say, hey, break out these processes. And from a standpoint of, okay, I want to see where some of my I.O. problems are, it's just, oh, just add these things to match my I.O. patterns, and then I can start watching and understanding the problems I may or may not be having. And it's like, it's beautiful, especially because now it uh, integrates with all my other, I have four other machines on our stack running it. Sure. So it's just another one in the list, which is. <laughs> well, and, and we're always looking out for that next thing too. So, you know, based on your feedback, people on the forums, you know, that's where it's important. You know, you have a voice, use it. If yeah. you're finding something, some tool out there is amazing. And wow, I really wish that was in free now. Well, don't just stop there at the wishing part. Put a ticket in. Enough people put it in. Request it. Eventually, it's going to end up on our roadmap, and we'll throw it in a product. So, you know, you can be involved even in that way. Yeah, and and these are uh, things I talk about. You know, both on my podcast and shows. Like, how can you, as an individual, if you're not a programmer, but you still want to contribute to open source, but you also don't have a bunch of money to just throw at it? Because mm -hmm. for businesses, I say, hey, throw some money at it. It's not a bad thing. All right. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, like I said, fill out the bug tickets. Don't ever com just complain about the software. Find it, make it repeatable, file a bug and say, hey, it does this when I do this. And yeah. it, it's amazing how quick the developers are to react to these things. Especially, I always re recommend, though, you have to make sure it's a repeatable thing, not this yes. one time it yes. happened. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll plead with people on that one. Definitely document, document, document. We yes. want, you know, a use case, a repeat, you know, a repeatable case. Because that is where we do spend a lot of time is just going through tickets going, okay, he had a one-off here. We can't re reproduce it in-house. We're not quite sure how to reproduce it. And that's where tickets kind of, you know, fall off the cliff, right? Is when, when you reach a point where it's like, well, the original reporter, we can't get a hold of. He's not responding to the ticket. But yeah. we still can't figure out how to reproduce this problem. And nobody else is reporting it, right? So for those, you, you just got to give us as much detail as you can and stick around long enough for us to work with you. Because our engineers are really good about doing that as well. Yeah, and I, like I said, you guys are, the engineers are active in the forums, uh, so they're, you know, acting with the community, That that's just, like I said, the whole team has been uh, really good, and oh, that's you know, good. the product kind of speaks for it, so. <laughs> that's, well, that's always good to hear. <laughs> well, anything else? I think you've uh, dropped quite a bit of knowledge on us here about up-and-coming stuff, so anything else you got to add, or? Oh, I think I've teased enough of the important things for now, okay. but like I said, I'm yeah, looking please, forward to those. please give us some uh, feedback on the new beta UI. And again, you know, if you find things you don't like, file a ticket, tell us why it's broken or what can be improved because we're always looking for that feedback because, you know, like bringing net data in, you may come up with, Oh, there's this new framework toolkit thing you can bring in, which will allow you to do X, Y, Z. Well, great. Tell us about it. Maybe we hadn't heard of it yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, question. Uh, is the beta available for download right now? Is it uh, next week? Um, Next week it will you, be. If you grab the nightlies, you can technically be running the beta now because we've okay. frozen it internally. So that's more or less what the beta is going to be. But if you want to wait just another week, we're still working out a couple last tickets before we release it. Um, we'll go ahead and get you the proper beta. It looks like next Monday is what we're targeting right now. Okay. So I, weird coincidence. I happen to have uh, some decommissioned servers sitting on a table in there. Where oh, okay. We, we want to do some testing mm -hmm. with some stuff. So we'll go ahead and load that in there. Yeah, fantastic. So. We'll definitely give it a whirl. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it, Tom's always a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback. Or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.